It is my pleasure now to introduce uh, Yu Shin, Economic Advisor and Head of Research at the Bank of International Settlements, who will be speaking on decentralization in digital finance, uh, possibilities and limits. Without uh, further ado, uh, Hyun, the floor is yours. Very good to have you here. Just to set the stage, you know, we can think of uh, money uh, in uh, in the classical theory of money as a record keeping device. It's um, it's a record of goods sold and services rendered in the past. And there is, in fact, a very famous paper by Narayana Kochalakota uh, that has an analysis of money as a giant ledger uh, that records the complete history of all transactions that so we have a sense of who is what to whom. Now, in that kind of approach, lugging around a huge um, ledger uh, was more a, a, a theoretical construct. Uh, it, it was there partly to show uh, how much more elegant money is as a convention, because you wouldn't need such a complete ledger uh, to record uh, who owes what to whom. But the irony, of course, is that the advances in cryptography and computing has actually made that kind of ledger feasible, technically. Uh, and that's where we have uh, blockchain technology. So let's go to the next slide. Great. So what is the rationale for, for this kind of uh, um, universal ledger? And what is the, the rationale behind blockchain? Well, the idea is that blockchain um, really um, brings governance benefits in the sense that it gives the kind of checks and balances that are going to promote the integrity of the system without having to rely on um, a, a central authority, a central trusted authority, you know, like the central bank, and without the need for uh, intermediaries like, like commercial banks. And the idea is that we can uh, update the ledger through consensus uh, by giving incentives for uh, to the to the validators, the miners, to update the ledger in such a way that will bring uh, that will uh, stick to the unique true path of of transactions. Now, um, it's a really ingenious idea, and uh, and the governance benefits are clearly very uh, are are clearly very large. But the question is, um, what are the costs of going in this direction? And uh, what are the trade-offs that are involved? And I'd like to say, um, uh, I'd like to uh, take a couple of uh, results from a working paper uh, that I've written with some with some colleagues uh, on um, in exploring some of the uh, some of the detailed trade-offs here. Let's go to the next slide. So one way of posing the trade-off is, in fact, um, to go to uh, Vitalik Buterin's so-called trilemma, the scalability trilemma. And the idea is that um, there are three possible objectives that, that we could envisage. One is the decentralization agenda that I've just talked about. Uh, but the other objective is to um, have security to form that consensus in a secure way uh, so that it's a, that it's a robust uh, and self-sustaining um, arrangement. But at the same time, there's a third objective, which is to be able to do this at scale uh, so that we can um, uh, take advantage of the, of the technology for the underlying economic reasons. Now, uh, Buterin's trilemma um, is, the, is the idea that uh, we can achieve two of these um, at one time, but it's difficult to, uh, to actually get all three. So for instance, if we wanted something which is decentralized and secure, uh, you know, having one chain and doing everything on chain would be one way of doing that, but then you would not be able to secure the scalability. If we go to the next slide, you can have a decentralized system, uh, but then scale things up by, for example, uh, dividing, up the com uh, dividing up the computation and the validation to many different subcommittees so-called sharding, um, and be able to scale it up. But perhaps uh, it's, it's, uh, it's unproven how secure that would be uh, and how different that would be from doing everything on-chain. And finally, if we go to the next slide, 
we get to the to the, to the other uh, edge of the triangle, which is, if you like, the traditional uh, financial system, where uh, you have security and it's scalable. Uh, but clearly, uh, we are moving away from the decentralization agenda. So, um, if we go to the next slide, the the trade-off, if you like, the uh, the choice is between the these decentralization benefits, um, but there is going to be um, a, a price to be paid, possibly because of the uh, of the choices entailed by the trilemma. Now, if we go to the next slide, let me just outline two different notions of scalability here. So one is the physical notion of scalability, which is about the time needed to reach consensus. So this is about um, the computation and the technical capacity of the system. And this is mostly about the laws of physics. But um, if you think about how this kind of system would, would work as a self-sustaining arrangement, we also have to think about the underlying incentives of the participants. And this is much more about the laws of economics. And here it's about the incentive compatibility of the validators um, and how self-sustaining these uh, arrangements would be as a robust equilibrium uh, in, a, in a game theoretic sense. So um, if we go to the next slide, a very popular way of overcoming the physical limits would be to uh, subdivide the problem into different uh, units, so-called sharding. Um, but I think the the um, uh, the economic incentives that would be underlying this kind of system uh, would still need to be looked at because um, you know one thing that we do know about the uh, about the Bitcoin blockchain um, and the Bitcoin protocol about uh, hitching the block onto the longest chain is that if you think about this as a game theoretic problem, following the Bitcoin protocol is in fact an equilibrium of game, and it's a pretty uh, you know, robust equilibrium. Uh, we have yet to really fully understand what the, what the economics of this kind of uh, system might be. And one thing we do know is that uh, in any kind of uh, system where you need to rely on incentives, you have to give sufficient rewards to the people uh, who are involved to provide a public good. And what's the public good? The public good is a clean and reconciled ledger that everyone can coordinate on. And to the extent that uh, you know, that doesn't come for free, you have to provide incentives. And um, so, so, the, so the thing to look out for, the telltale sign of a well-functioning system, a robust equilibrium, would be whether the insiders are getting a lot of rents. Uh, in order to uh, to sustain the system. So let me give you three examples. So the first one, if you go to the next slide, is this very interesting paper by Igor Makarov and Antoinette Shaw that they've uh, written, and I highly recommend this, uh, this paper. What they've done is to use the public nature of the Bitcoin blockchain and have mapped out the whole, uh, the economics of the underlying relationships. And what they find are really quite fascinating results. So the first result they find is that Bitcoin transactions are mostly tied to investments rather than uh, for monetary exchange. So here are some numbers. They find that 90% of transactions are basically noise designed to mask the user identity. So uh, having many, many uh, um, addresses that you pass the payment through in order to mask your true identity. And among the real transactions that are identified with economic actors, 75% uh, are those linked to exchanges, online wallets, and so on. And indeed, this kind of finding is very consistent with a working paper that we put out by Raphael Auer uh, and his co-author, which finds that if you look at the survey evidence, the holders of Bitcoin are not, uh, if you like, uh, you know, people in hoodies in dark basements. They're actually um, you know, uh, uh, normal people, young male, well-educated, and they do not distrust traditional finance, um, but they are, are clearly in it for the, uh, for the investments. And the other thing that emerges is that far from dispensing with intermediaries, uh, new types of intermediaries emerge. And in the case of Bitcoin, it's the exchanges, um, and they are the focal nodes in the Bitcoin network. And they act as investment vehicles, holding customer um, uh, assets, uh, in custody in these cold wallets. So by the fact that they're in cold wallets, 
these customers are not taking part in the governance, they're not taking part in the decentralized you know, consensus, but instead they're using it much more like a, like a mutual fund. So if you click to the next couple of slides, let me just skip those. Uh, I had a couple of charts on the size of these cold wallets, but I will skip those uh, for the benefit of time. And let me go to the second example, which is the example uh, of minor extractable value. So we're talking about rent. So where would the rents be? If you're a validator, well, in the uh, in the Ethereum blockchain, um, you know there is this thing called a miner extractable value, and it's a measure of the profit that a miner or a validator can make uh, by um, you know through the ability to uh, to uh, to hitch the block onto the onto the next uh, uh, onto the chain. And for example, if a validator spots an arbitrage opportunity, so there are some transactions that are uh, waiting to be validated. Uh, the validator can see these transactions and can put in an order, uh, 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 you know, in in view of those transactions, and therefore benefit from from that information. And uh, this is a very interesting uh, corner of the literature right now, where uh, there are some quite substantial numbers. Um, and this is just one chart from um, from one source, which gives a lower bound to this minor extractable value, and it's getting pretty substantial. If we go to the next example on the next uh, slide, another way that we can gauge the rents that are accruing to the insiders would be just to see uh, what are the transactions costs in these DeFi platforms. And compared to um, uh, the traditional exchanges, they're still very large. Uh, for example, if you look at the right-hand panel, uh, we're talking about uh, you know transactions uh, where one transaction would take tens of dollars or indeed um, in you know at the peak of these uh, these charts, we're talking about transactions costs for for one traction uh, for one transaction which exceed uh, one hundred dollars. So what um, uh, if we go to the next slide? Let me just give you a very potted summary, and I will um, and I will wrap up. Uh, so what this paper does um, is to look at the problem uh, from an economic perspective. We say let's um, let's. Uh, uh, Think about an economic problem in a standard monetary economics setting, and then um, solve the problem of the incentives faced by the validators. And the validators bear a small cost, and the cost varies slightly between the validators, but they are engaged in a public good contribution game. And the public good, as I said earlier, is a clean and reconciled ledger that everyone benefits from. But because of the slight differences in cost, if you actually solve that kind of game using global game techniques, what we know is that uh, coordination has to be uh, has to overcome uh, a great deal of these uh, uh, incentive problems, and you can overcome them by giving large payoffs to the validators. In other words, large rents that accrue to the validators is really a feature uh, and not a bug. And um, uh, I think one of the things that comes through uh, from from this uh, from this kind of uh, analysis. Let's uh, fast forward three slides, please, and let's go to the key takeaways. And I can and I can wrap up. I think one of the things that really comes up from this kind of analysis is that technology can certainly take us a long way, but uh, it is not everything. And uh, in particular, there is a very important role for the incentives of the participants that are going to be key. So when we look at these new um, uh, Ethereum-based, you know, new versions of blockchains that are coming up, and they're uh, based on uh, proof of stake rather than proof of work. And what that means is that the entrenched positions of the insiders and the rents that accrue to the insiders, if anything, uh, get worse because uh, the way that you become a validator is to have a large stake, and that and that large stake gives you tremendous rents as a validator. And because of this very uh, unequal distribution of the stakes, what it means is that you have uh, a tremendous uh, advantage and uh, ability to to collect those rents. And um, one of the things that really comes up from the from the analysis in in our economic model is that yes, there is a trade-off. Uh, under some configurations, the decentralized ledger does very well, and that's the optimal arrangement. 
but in some other occasions, uh, on uh, and but in most uh, parameter settings, uh, in fact, the centralized ledger actually does best unless there is a uh, governance weakness. There's a weakness in the rule of law. Uh, there's a weakness in contract enforcement, etc., which necessitate a, a decentralized ledger. And um, there's a crucial parameter here, which is um, we vote on the correct ledger and we, um, we update um, the ledger through supermajority voting. And a crucial parameter is what is the supermajority threshold that will allow you to validate a particular block. And that choice turns out to be really, really important. Of course, the, the strongest uh, rule would be unanimity, where everyone has to agree in order for you to hitch the latest block. But it turns out that unanimity just isn't feasible. Uh, it will not get you the, de uh, the decentralized consensus. You have to relax that. So there is going to be uh, um, trade-offs in the way that we arrange the, uh, uh, the, super, the, the, super, the super majority voting threshold. Um, but the parameters of the problem really matter a lot. So what we do here is we, we, we try and uh, find a mapping between uh, the underlying uh, features of the problem and the, and the exact design uh, of, the, um, of the consensus mechanism. So let me conclude and I'll go to the final slide, which is the next one. Um, so I think this, that given the importance of the rents that have to agree, that have to accrue to the insiders, I think it does raise a very interesting question, which is clearly um, during the early stages when there are inflows, um, this is enough to sustain high rents because there are new people coming in uh, and the enthusiasm is, is, is going to give it momentum. The question really is what happens when the system matures? So uh, when the system is mature enough, and the profits begin to get squeezed and the rents begin to get squeezed out, is there sufficient rent in the system to provide the glue uh, to keep the decentralized consensus going? Uh, and I think this is where a theoretical um, investigation can really, uh, can really help. So Lucrezia, let me, let me conclude there. Thank you very much. It's an intriguing presentation and, uh, you know, getting a little bit further from your paper. OK, so for the general audience, uh, can you tell us a little bit more, given the fact that uh, you are sitting in the BIS? How do you think about how regulation uh, should then evolve, uh, you know, or in relation to, you know, your uh, your, your points on, uh, you know, governance? of this decentralized system. So is, what is the policy agenda, in particular in your institution, since you're you know, talking from, from, the, from the BIS? Thanks, Lucrecia, for that very uh, important question. I think that you know, there are probably um, two or three, possibly three uh, strands that we, can, uh, that we can approach that question from. Uh, on the one hand, there is the, there is the consumer protection point. Uh, are there applicable rules uh, that uh, um, would be appropriate that would be appropriate to, to apply in these contexts? Uh, I mean, that's the to you know for the purpose of consumer protection and the market integrity. Another type of question would be uh, what are the financial stability consequences, especially when there are points of contact with the mainstream financial system, and and there there would be additional. Um, uh, you know, considerations that might uh, might come in. I think on the governance point, I mean, that's a very broad issue. And uh, um, uh, these issues are so new that I don't think we have uh, any an existing framework to really put these questions, uh, um, to, to really, uh, you know, pigeonhole these questions under. But uh, the BI says, you know, also um, hosts the, the Committee on Payments and Market Infrastructures, the the, the CPMI um, and the principles of financial market infrastructure clearly, you know, will also have a bearing on uh, on on these uh, uh, on these new exchanges, on these new platforms as infrastructures. So, um, I mean, needless to say, uh, you know, these are very new issues that uh, that we need to uh, understand better and to then. Um, 
and then to uh, you know apply uh, to the extent that we have uh, rules that apply. But if we find that there are gaps, uh, and the gaps are sufficient that uh, you know they they really do miss something very substantial, then I think there is a case for you know going back to the drawing board and rethinking some of the principles uh, from the ground up. Okay, thank you. So I have a question from Anna, Anna Pavlova, um, you know, who well, actually the first comment is this is was an excellent presentation. So that, uh, and then she asked you, uh, what do you think is going to be the future of central bank digital currencies? Um, since once introduced, is this going to crowd out Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies? What is your view on that? Well, Anna, I think uh, on the Bitcoin question, you know, as I said in my presentation, this uh, this new uh, paper by um, Makarov and Shaw, I think, uh, shows uh, um, very clearly that uh, Bitcoin is not really used for monetary exchange. It is primarily uh, something that is held, you know, as an asset. So probably, uh, you know, that the um, the points of contact between cryptocurrencies and and uh, central bank digital currencies will be pretty minimal. Um, I think the CBDC discussion, I think, uh, you know, draws on, uh, you know, very strong, uh, you know, imperatives for, for policymakers. And they arise from uh, the, the centrality of data uh, in the digital economy. Uh, you know, on the one hand, it gives rise to issues of uh, closed networks, market power, data silos, and so on. And uh, having an open architecture um, uh, would be a very important imperative, and CBDCs may have an important role to play. So that's one. The other side would be um, how do we make sure that we uh, you know, guard against uh, illicit activities, anti-money laundering, how do we ensure anti-money laundering, KYC, uh, and guard against you know ransomware attacks and so on. And some notion of digital ID is going to be crucial for that. Uh, and in that respect, uh, you know CBDCs have uh, uh, very much more in common with the conventional financial system. But having said all that, of course, as soon as we get to digital IDs, we have to think about data privacy and how do we uh, um, ensure a data governance framework that's going to ensure uh, that only the absolutely necessary information is used by either the private sector or indeed the public sector to uh, perform their roles. And I think here we we have a lot of very good experience already in the way that the conventional financial system through these retail financial system, uh, the, these retail fast payment systems have worked. And in particular, the, uh, the application programming interfaces that are associated with um, you know the the payment in, uh, the, the payment initiation services or account um, uh, information services where you can actually check your balances in all your accounts through one app or indeed initiate the payment from another uh, account at another bank through the app of your you know main bank so that kind of you know technology has been around ever since the 1970s you know this is public key cryptography uh, actually it's also the uh, the technology used in in bitcoin um, but the technology is is already there, and I, I suppose if you have already a well functioning retail fast payment system, you are I would say seventy percent of the way there towards having a CBDC already, um, and it would be a very marginal step uh, towards that. Um, so I think it's more the the discussion with uh, of what uh, would CBDCs do in the debate about uh, big techs coming into payment systems. What if the big tech is also a stable coin? Um, uh, how would that uh, affect the integrity of the monetary system? Would that lead to possible fragmentation, et cetera? Uh, and I think that's the kind of debate where the CBDCs would be uh, more central. Well, with this very optimistic note, <laughs> I think you know the, we are running out of time. So well, thank you very much for, for the presentation.